All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the February webinar for the Lake States Fire Science Consortium. I'm Jack McGowan Stinsky, and I'll be moderating the webinar this afternoon. For those who may be joining us for the first time, let me give you a little background. We have Fire Science Fire Science Program in one of 15 regional consortia of fire science exchanges across the country. Our mission is to accelerate understanding of fire science information by federal, tribal, state, local, and private stakeholders across the lake states and adjacent Canadian provinces of Ontario and Manitoba. We strive to be inclusive and neutral science partners working to foster collaboration among researchers and practitioners and organizations and individuals and by developing innovative approaches to science delivery while facilitating dialogue about new science findings and emerging needs. Before we get started, let's take a few seconds and look at our Adobe Connect webinar interface. To ask a question and interact with the attendees, please use the chat box located in the lower right-hand portion. Make sure that when you type your question, you also click the send button. We'll be monitoring these questions to make sure that there's an opportunity to address them. If you'd like to learn more about the consortium and what we are doing, please visit our website at lakestatesfireside.net. Now on to today's webinar, Quantification of Understory Fuels in Superior National Forest Using LIDAR Data by Jeff Irwin. Jeff Irwin is a Department of Interior Path Geological Survey stationed at the Earth Resources Observation and Science Bureau Center, Master's Department of Geography. has made measurements with airborne lighter. So work on surveys of new lighter technologies, including topographic metrics, using conventional survey methods to little station and level. And surveyor, a private firm, focused on cadastrophic geographic surveying. Jeff's surveyor has given him strong from the field. Matt, take it away, Jeff. Uh, hey, Jack. It uh, looks like a lot of people are having trouble with the audio kit cutting out. Hey, I was... Um, Jeff, go ahead and talk and see if people can hear you okay. Uh, hey, everybody. Can you hear me? Hopefully. Okay. That's good. <laughs> All right. Take right, it buddy. away, Jeff. Thanks for joining, uh, Jack. Thanks for the uh, introduction. And thanks. Uh, I've been working on this project with Curtis Nelson and Birgit Peterson, also from Arrows. And I'd like to take this time to thank them for giving me the opportunity to get a start with the USGS. All right. So uh, in case anybody needs to duck out, I'll tell you what we really learned in Superior National Forest. And that's if you don't like being rained on every day or being attacked by vicious mosquitoes, uh, you probably shouldn't do summer field work up in northern Minnesota. All right. Uh, so we're talking about Superior National Forest today, so I feel I should give a little information about it. Uh, Superior National Forest is located in the Arrowhead region of Minnesota. Uh, as you can see, Superior National Forest occupies a significant area, about 3 million acres. Uh, 445,000 of which are actually surface water. Superior uh, National Forest is the eighth most, eighth most visited national forest in the nation and is home to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Huh. Uh, so what's going on up there? Well, ecosystems within the Great Lakes region are changing uh, for multiple reasons. A consequence of these changes includes an increase in species like balsam fir. Uh, balsam fir is of concern because it is a species that easily burns and is a ladder fuel. Ladder fuels allow fire to transfer from the forest floor into the upper canopy. Uh, this image shows a balsam fir sapling uh, experiencing needle cast. 
further adding to fuel loads. Uh, forest managers are concerned about the increase in the amount of amount and spatial extent of balsam fir for multiple reasons, including the need to protect structures and the wildland urban interface. Uh, due to limited access to much of Superior National Forest, and also to the difficulty of using satellite remote sensing for measuring understory fuels, the amount and extent of balsam fir and other understory fuels in Superior National Forest is unknown. A potential solution explored by this research is the use of airborne light detection and ranging, commonly known as LIDAR. LIDAR is a technology that can be used to generate three-dimensional point information by employing laser ranging. Uh, the image above shows a LIDAR point cloud with points colored by elevation. Blue points are low in elevation, and red points are high in elevation. If you look at the image, you can almost pick out the crowns of the trees. Uh, LIDAR has been used successfully to map vegetation characteristics like canopy height and canopy cover. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service has established an 80,000 acre study area and several field plots along the Gunflint Trail in the eastern portion of Superior National Forest. Field data were collected using the cover line intercept method, which is used to estimate canopy cover for a plot. Canopy cover is the percentage of the ground covered by tree canopy. Uh, field data were collected in two phases by the Forest Service. During phase one, cover line intercept data were collected for trees that were larger than 20, excuse me, 12 and a half centimeters diameter at breast height and in phase two, measurements of trees that were less than 12 and a half centimeters diameter at breast height were taken. Uh, one thing to note about the cover line intercept method is that intermingling tree crowns from trees of the same species are measured as one crown. However, if trees are of different species, the crowns are measured separately, which could lead to cover values greater than 100% for the transect total. Uh, during the 2015 field season, three U.S. Forest Service crews collected uh, phase one data at 130 plots and phase two data at 33 plots. In July of 2016, we collected phase two data at an additional 13 plots. In addition to the cover line intercept data, we also took photographs and densiometer measurements at those plots plus an additional seven plots. Uh, on the map here, you can see the yellow dots represent the Forest Service plots, and the green dots are plots that were measured by arrows. So just to give you an idea of the field conditions, I've included some plot photographs. Uh, you can see that even where the overstory is not very thick, the understory vegetation is still quite dense. Uh, LIDAR data were available for the Superior National Forest region from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Wolpert Incorporated conducted an airborne LIDAR survey over the Arrowhead region in June of 2011. The LIDAR data were not particularly dense, but did have a maximum of four returns. Uh, the LIDAR data were normalized into a height above ground format. We then derived several LIDAR metrics from the normalized point cloud, including several height percentiles, canopy covers, and relative densities to be used as predictor variables. Uh, you can see in our profiles here, uh, this is the regular profile that the arrow is pointing at. The ground surface is uh, undulating. 
versus in the normalized point cloud, the ground surface has been flattened out so that all measurements are made relative to the ground surface. Uh, to give you an example of a metric that has come out of the research here, uh, this is the height of the 99th percentile of LiDAR returns, uh, essentially representing the top of canopy for the most part. Okay, so for the 45 plots that had both phase one and phase two data collected, we took the mean amount of transit canopy measured in each plot and compared that to LIDAR metrics for each plot using simple regression. Uh, we were not quite satisfied with the initial results of the, the simple linear regression, and so we moved on. We decided to try a multiple regression model. Uh, we decided that five variables would be the maximum that we would use to keep the model meaningful. In our original attempt, we used a trial and error approach to get a model with four variables that had an R squared of about 0.63. We then used the LEAPS package with the R statistics program to derive a model. The LEAPS package can calculate all the possible models for multiple variables and allows the user to specify the maximum number of explanatory variables. We kept the maximum amount set at five and then used the linear model and update functions with an R whittle the model down to the three most significant predictor variables. The variables were the height of the 50th percentile returns, the relative point density between 8 and 10 meters, and the total cover. Uh, the model for the R, or the R squared for the model was a little over 0 0.65. We then put the, or output the model spatially, which you can see here. This is understory canopy taken from the transects. We then converted that into an understory cover model. So you'll notice that the range of values, hopefully you can see them, uh, which you would expect to be from 0 to 100%, range from about negative 8,500% to almost 300%. Uh, the high values were not necessarily a huge surprise to us given that the cover line intercept method can have transects with greater than 100% cover. Inspection of the model did not reveal any pixels with those extreme negative values, and the map was confirmed at a selection of pixels. Looking at the spatial patterns that can be seen in the model, uh, revealed that there were some large areas where the understory was low. You can see here up in the northwestern corner, another one here, Another one here, and this interesting looking rectangular area down in the southwest. Uh, so the question then became, uh, what the heck are we seeing? It uh, actually turned out that we were seeing fire scars. Uh, so this is some data from the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity Project, and it seems to match pretty well with the model. This is the MTBS fire data for the 2006 Red Eye, Salmon Lake, and Cavity Lake fires, along with the 2007 Ham Lake fire. Uh, since MTBS only maps fires that are greater than, than 500 acres in the east, we had to look for other data sources to try to identify those smaller areas. Uh, we then moved to land fire disturbance data, and you can see that some, some of the matching land fire map disturbances. Now, it's not all a perfect match, but you have to remember that the land fire data has 13 years worth of disturbances, and the LIDAR was only flown once. The dark rectangular area in southwestern Cook County took a little while to figure out. Uh, it turns out that this area was apparently overlapped by multiple flight lines and came out as sort of an anomaly when we put everything together. Uh, at this point, we were feeling better about our understory cover model, but had decided that there wasn't anything that we could see in the LIDAR that would help us identify that balsam fir component. So we determined that we needed to look at other data sources. Uh, 
As it turns out, we are not the only group of investigators working on projects with Superior National Forest. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service provided us with some, with some work done by investigators from the University of Minnesota in the same study area. Uh, the most interesting products for us were the map of forest types and their crown base height models. Uh, these were made using 5-meter uh, rapid-eye satellite imagery. In order to compare the forest type map with the understory cover model, uh, we created a series of binary rasters. A binary raster is a raster in which the values of interest are coded as a 1, and the other values are coded as a 0. As a zero. For example, in this raster, all the pixels where the understory cover is greater than 70% are coded as 1 and show up in this light blue color. All the other areas were coded as 0 and show up as the black. Um, we then determined how much area of each forest type intersected each of our understory cover binary rasters. Uh, looking at the raw data didn't provide us with much information. Uh, the forest type classes that stood out were simply the ones that had the most area. But when we normalized the forest type classes by the proportion of pixels that each class represented, it appeared to us that there was some sort of correlation between the balsam fir, aspen, paper, birch class, the quaking aspen class, and to a lesser extent, the paper, birch, forest type class, and the amount of understory cover. Uh, so on this graph, uh, 91, the light blue cross is the quaking aspen class. Um, little gold dot is balsam fir, aspen, paper, birch. And then 92, uh, brown X, is the paper birch class. So you can see that as the understory cover is going up from left to right, uh, the area that each uh, class is taking up, particularly the uh, balsam fir, aspen, paper, birch, and uh, quaking aspen classes are standing out quite a bit more than the others. Uh, classes 1, 2, and 3, these here in the middle, those are uh, jack pine, red pine, and white pine. And then the uh, red triangle is uh, upland black spruce. We also took and compared the understory cover model to land cover data from the National Land Cover Database in the same manner. Again, the raw data weren't very useful. Uh, results with the normalized NLCD areas seemed to be in agreement with the normalized forest type class area results. The top NLCD classes were deciduous forest, which seems to line up with quaking aspen and paper birch forest types, and mixed forest, which we interpreted to be comparable to balsam, balsam fir, aspen, paper birch forest class. So here we've got class 41 in NLCD is deciduous forest. And then class 43, the light blue cross, is the uh, mixed forest type. And class 42 is evergreen forest. So you can see that. Uh, Particularly, the, the deciduous is standing out here, and then to a lesser extent, the mixed forest. All right. So, the University of Minnesota researchers also produced a couple of crown base height products. We thought that there would be an inverse relationship between the percentage of understory cover and the crown base height products. But we really found no relationship when we directly compared the models. To further investigate those crown base height products, we broke the crown base height data down into a couple different types of binary rasters. We compared those binary raster series to the forest type data. 
The first series was areas with heights greater than selected threshold values, and the second type of binary raster series was areas within selected two meter height bins. What we found was that as crown base height increases, the pine classes occupied the most area. So again, uh, down here on the bottom, we've got crown base height. These are the height bins, so 0, 0 to 2, 2 to 4, et cetera. Um, and this is the normalized area on the y-axis. And So we've got the forest classes of 1, 2, and 3, black, blue, and uh, green here, standing out as the crown base height increases. So those, again, are jack pine, uh, red pine, and white pine. Uh, we did the same thing again with the NLCD. The evergreen forest class was the dominant class as crown base height increased. We have interpreted this as being, again, in agreement with the results from the exercise comparing the understory cover to the forest height. So here in the green, we've got class 42, which is the evergreen class. And then uh, 41 is the deciduous forest. Right. Uh, the Forest Service also put us in contact with Dr. Peter Walter from Iowa State University. Uh, Dr. Walter has mapped the basal areas of several tree species in part of Superior National Forest. Dr. Walter collected tree basal area data with a metric uh, balsam area, sorry, metric basal area prism at uh, various or at variable radius field plots and correlated them with Landsat images to produce the maps. Uh, you can see his map of balsam fir basal area in square meters per pixel here. Uh, we have taken Dr. Walter's balsam fir basal area map trimmed it to the same extent as the understory cover model, classified it, and used those classifications to generate some more binary rasters. This binary raster is Please hold while I confirm your passcode. Thank you. Your passcode is confirmed. When you hear the tone, you will be the fourth person to join the meeting. All right, I believe we're back on. Uh, please let us know, folks, if you can hear me or definitely Jeff. OK, we're good to go again? <laughs> good to go. All right. Uh, let's see. I'll go back a slide here and just to hopefully get everybody on the same page. <laughs> All right, so uh, what we did, uh, hopefully you heard this, we've been collaborating with uh, Dr. Peter Walter from Iowa State. Uh, he's produced a series of basal area maps for several different tree species up in Superior National Forest. Uh, we took his data and uh, classified it for the balsam fir in the five classes from low to high. Um, so the class one being low and class five being high. So what we then did then was we compared uh, those five classes of binary rasters to 
our understory cover binary rasters. And uh, what we thought to be interesting was that uh, in both the raw area, which is shown in this uh, graph, And the uh, normalized area, which you can see here, uh, is that there seems to be a break around that 40% uh, cover range, number one. And number two, uh, class five, the red triangles here, uh, seem to be popping out at that uh, moderate to high uh, percentage of uh, understory cover. So we've interpreted this, or interpreted this as uh, having a correlation between the two models. Uh, we've also taken Dr. Walter's data and used it to calculate a proportion of balsam fir that represents out of the total species, uh, which is this map here on the left. Uh, and then we combine that with a cleaned up version of our understory cover model here on the right uh, to produce a balsam fir undercover story map. Okay. Sorry, I'm having a few issues now. But okay. The question then became, uh, are these products any good? And to find that out, Brigitte and I returned to Superior National Forest last May to collect some validation data. Uh, so we spent a couple weeks up there at the Seagull Guard Station. Luckily this time we didn't have to deal with too many mosquitoes, but we did wake up to frost or snow many of the mornings. Uh, by the way, I would take those cold nights of sleeping any day over the mosquitoes. All right. Uh, we even met a new friend at the guard station. Plus, we also met Jack on that trip and had a really good meeting with him. Uh, while we were up there, we managed to get a little work done. Uh, we measured an additional 24 plots. which we have used to uh, validate our models. Um, so validation hasn't been as good as we had hoped for. Uh, so the original model had an R squared of about 0 0.65. Uh, in this upper left-hand graph, you can see measured understory cover on the x-axis versus uh, predicted understory cover on the y-axis. Uh, in the upper right here, you can see the uh, measured versus predicted. Uh, so predicted is in yellow and measured is in blue. And in the lower left here, you can see the difference between the measured and predicted amounts. So this is measured minus predicted with this dashed line here representing the mean difference. So you, the mean difference is about 14% or a little over. Uh, but as you can see, it, kind of looks like the model is a little bit all over the place, uh, actually having a tendency to underpredict a little bit. So this is measured minus predicted. And then in the graph here on the lower right, that's the mean difference between uh, measured and predicted. And the mean difference, uh, mean absolute difference was about 47%. Uh, keep in mind that uh, 100% was not the upper limit for this exercise, so that makes it look a little bit better. All right. Uh, we also compared our field validation measurements from last May to the balsam fir understory cover raster as well. Uh, results were not too good. Uh, we suspect that much of this comes from different field techniques that went into making the individual components. Uh, for example, using the cover line intercept method to measure a transect in which there was a cluster of balsam fir with intermingling crowns, 
uh, would result in all the balsam fir being measured as one crown, which would not reflect each individual crown. However, if you were using uh, Peter Walter's field methodology with the basal area metric prism, all individual balsam fir trees would be taken into account. This may, this may be a case where rescaling the model uh, may be appropriate. Uh, additionally, balsam fir are typically found in the understory, so a correction factor may need to be applied to count for that as well. Um, as we just looked at the uh, proportion of balsam and straight up multiplied it by our understory cover. So uh, these graphs, again, are laid out the same way as before. So measured uh, compared to predicted, and then the dark blue is the uh, measured value, the gray is the predicted, and then down here we've got measured minus predicted, and you can see in this case it's actually mainly under predicting, and then uh, we've got the absolute differences down here in the lower right. All right. Uh, to see if there was a better way to model the understory cover, we then generated some more models using various strategies with random, uh, random samples of the combined 70 plots that we had. Uh, these strategies included stratification of the data and trying different percentages of training and testing plots, uh, using the 70 plots that were measured in the field as a pool to draw from. I'm not really going to go into the details about the modeling strategies, uh, but what we've found to be heartening is that uh, the models seem to be picking out similar variables to use. So you can see here in the variables line, most of them seem to be picking out uh, the height of the 50th percentile returns, the relative density from 8 to 10 meters in total cover, which is what we had with the original. So. We take that as a good sign. So to sum things up, we have generated a model for understory cover in the Cook County portion of Superior National Forest. A sort of confluence of evidence has given us confidence that the understory cover model has potential. We also think it may be possible to combine our understory cover model with Dr. Wolter's balsam fir data. We have conducted field work to validate our model, and additional models seem to be picking up on the same or similar metrics to map understory cover. Some of the conclusions that have come out of this research include that it looks possible to map and quantify understory fuels with LIDAR. Unfortunately, the plot data we have does not include the entire range of cover in Superior National Forest, and more field data could improve the modeling. We also feel that other data sets need to be added to the LIDAR to extract the balsam fir component of the understory. With that being said, we would welcome questions. Okay, folks, type your questions questions in the chat box, and this is assuming that the audio is working and you can hear me okay. And we'll give people a few minutes to um, get some questions in. So while we're waiting, Jeff, a uh, question I have is, um, you know, is there an, an intent to continue this on Superior National Forest or elsewhere? Uh, yeah, we would we would love to uh, continue this work in Superior National Forest. Uh, we have ideas of what we would like to do. Uh, unfortunately, our funding for this project is really at an end. So, without further funding, um, it's going to be difficult. All right. And it looks like we actually <laughs> lost the visual. Hopefully, we don't lose the audio again. Apologize, folks, that with tech issues here. Um, just type in, let us know that you're at least hearing this, and then type in questions. All right, we're just getting folks typing.
Yeah, please type your questions in the chat, the chat box. One question here. Oh, Kirschbaum, you said, what were the uncertainties of Walter's data? If we take a look at the Jeffs, you can read. Oh, yeah, I see it. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, and unfortunately I'm not sitting at my desk. But if I recall relatively correctly, I believe his balsam fir model had an R squared of about 0 0.85, 0 0.8, 0 0.85, if I recall correctly. I don't know if the total cover um, spatial area model was quite as good. I'm sorry, the total species basal area wasn't quite as good, but I think it was similar. All right. I guess I was a little off. <laughs> That's part of the answer. Ah. <laughs> uh, good. <laughs> Aeration. Does any questions more coming in? So if somebody wanted to um, evaluate using this technique, um, would they, who would they contact uh, at ESGS and walk through the procedure? Uh, apparently, I'm uh, being pointed to as being the guy of who to contact, and uh, my email address is jrirwin at usgs.gov. And that uh, that email is also up on our web page, and that's also where we will have a recording of this uh, webinar. Um, a link to the recording and the PDF too, so you can reach there. I guess some folks typing in. Oh, and there it is. There's your little email right there for people too. So. You can get it on the website to copy it down there. All right. Well, folks, if you have any more questions, please type them in. Um, I know Birgit and uh, Curtis are sitting in there with you. Jeff, I mean, do you guys have any more uh, thoughts or questions of your own that you could present? Yeah, this is this is Bernadette Peterson. Um, Jeff alluded to the fact that we wanted to do more field data. And one of the challenges that we've had working in a natural system like this is to really account for the overstory that's including the understory, which is the part that we're actually trying to measure um, from the LIDAR data. So um, one thing we'd like to do when getting hopefully getting the chance, if not um, if not in Superior, then potentially in another location that's a little closer to our home base here in South Dakota. Um, is to take advantage um, up there. There's a thing that's called Washington. There's, there's an area where um, back in the 1930s, I believe, um, or late 20s, early 30s, um, the pine plantation was essentially put in as in part of the Superior National Forest. And when we explored them, we noticed there were different stages of undergrowth coming underneath um, in terms of you know, age, height, species. That's an area where we'd like to take advantage and actually take what's called a terrestrial LIDAR system, not one that's airborne that measures the, the forest from above, but one that we can take and make measurements from below, really does quite cloud measurements. And kind of compare and see, okay, how, um, how is the overstory impacting what's under, underneath um, in, in the understory and kind of compare both the airborne and the terrestrial LIDAR data. So we have access to a terrestrial LIDAR system this time around. We didn't have that when we were up there in May, otherwise we would have taken advantage of that back then. That's kind of just an example of how we're trying to get a more quantitative estimate of what uh, what might be able what we might be able to detect from the airborne lidar data. Okay, 
Good, and that that was what I was looking for is to see you know, if there's ways to invent in some ways to improve efficiency. That's a, another potential way to compare um, and gain efficiency. Yeah, yeah, when we can compare the two LiDAR data sets, it's a little bit closer to comparing apples to apples versus you know, one challenge we've had um, is really coming up with a great method or a good or usable method of, of making the measurements that we want to observe in the field. Um, you know, anything that we do as you know, Jeff alluded to, the um, point line intercept has certain limitations. Um, and we've tried doing other methods of using photography as well. And there's just challenges with that, trying to capture all the information that you want. And so having a terrestrial LIDAR seems to be the most ideal way to do it. Um, and then you're kind of comparing light data to light data. Yeah, the major difference with, between the scans and uh, the airborne data is going to be really the density of the data. Um, so a terrestrial scanner, you get some really, really dense point clouds. You can have point spacing down to a couple centimeters between points versus uh, what we had up there with the uh, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources collect was we were looking at, you know, roughly half a point per square meter. So you can glean a lot more information from the terrestrial scanner. All right, I think I have audio back. <laughs> okay, it's still there. Yeah. <laughs> we're still there. No. I apologize for this. Well, we just had a variety of audio problems and tech issues. So um, um, I don't see any more rolling in. Um, but yeah, certainly if you um, had anything you need to follow up on, uh, do so now. Otherwise, we'll start wrapping up. I think we're good here, Jack. Hopefully. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. So again, uh, Jeff, I appreciate this so much, and, and thanks for everybody for putting up with our uh, technical difficulties. Um, again, if you uh, missed this or uh, want to review this webinar, or if somebody else uh, who wanted to see this but missed it, um, I'll get the recording up of this on the archive web page. Um, tend to do that later this afternoon, unless I continue to have tech issues. Um, the next webinar. Uh, next month's webinar, so that will be March 15th. That's on monitoring the response of moose to large fires in Minnesota uh, by Mike Schrage. Um, and there's a web page for that, so you can get the connection link uh, to that. Um, so with that, we'll wrap this up. And again, thanks so much, Jeff, and everyone for participating today. And everybody have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much, Jack. <laughs>